So to crown this session, this day, this conference as a whole, what could one wish? If not, a final lecture by Professor Jonathan Israel. To introduce him would be totally ridiculous and idle. His subject, I'm not totally surprised, but I'm anxious to hear what he's going to say, is Spinoza's formulation of the radical enlightenment's two defining doctrines. How much did he owe to the Dutch Golden Age political theological context? How much exactly? Mm -hmm. We're listening. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that introduction, which is much too kind. I'm certainly not going to crown the conference, but before starting, I must say it's been an absolutely wonderful conference, and I must thank the, uh, the organizers for having invited me to participate, and I do hope we're going to see these papers, very valuable papers that we've had in the last two days in, in print. I've learned an enormous amount. Well, I, I can't, uh, in the very limited time, sorry, um, go into definitions of the radical enlightenment, which in some respects, or for most people, is a somewhat new term and rather unstable, as lots of people here will know there have been some quite violent polemics on this subject, especially in America, although some uh, French historians have also participated in, um, and French uh, philosophers have also participated in this, but it's especially an American phenomenon, I think, an eruption of strong, scornful feeling about this uh, proposed new entity in intellectual history of radical enlightenment. But I want to begin, all I'm going to say is that it isn't actually a new idea, though it's often treated as something that's just burst through the window very recently. That's not at all true. And it goes back to the 1920s. It's actually Leo Strauss who first thought it in, in German. It's actually quite a well-established term already in the 1920s and 30s, radicale aufklärung. Uh, Although it, it would be true to say that uh, Leo Strauss gives a very systematic, a very organized argument, he uses the term radicale aufklärung, I must emphasize that several times, in uh, Spinoza's critique of religion, which he started working on, as many people here will know, in 1925. Um, it, 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 called, it does boil down more to atheism than to the uh, political, democratic, republican dimension uh, for Strauss, but uh, as the idea develops later, uh, and another writer who is extremely important, and this time American, in the development of the idea, namely Henry May, I don't know why he's been left to such a great extent out of the discussion. Henry May's a book, uh, 1976, The American Enlightenment, is terribly important for anybody who believes that the French Revolution and the American Revolution have much greater parallelism uh, than is generally thought to be the case by historians, and this is especially so when you look at intellectual frameworks justifying revolution in the late 18th century. There, in particular, you see this close parallelism, and nowhere more so than in the American ambassador in Paris in 1789, Thomas Jefferson, who there was no more important and more prominent advocate of radical enlightenment than him. All I'm going to say in my uh, defining uh, opening paragraph is that uh, in my own understanding and um, attempts to interpret radical enlightenment, what matters more than anything else is coupling together the rejection of religious authority in the framing of the laws and the moral order of society, <coughs> reject uh, religious authority, tying this together, with, not with republicanism, as some critics erroneously think it is, but with democratic republicanism, which is something very different. Practically all modern scholars who study the Cirque de Spinoziste tie the phenomenon, the emergence of the erad radical enlightenment framework in its earliest manifestation to the fact that the United Provinces were republican and not monarchical, were religiously pluriform, not uniform, lacked a strong state church, and were a society where censorship was comparatively weak. To this, we should add that the ruling oligarchy lacked genuinely aristocratic credentials. What, uh, aristocratic republicanism was terribly important in 18th century Europe, strongly embedded in the Swiss cantons, Bern and Zurich and so on, strongly embedded in Italy and in Genoa and Venice, 
and, but based on a, a real aristocratic system, not the bogus, it wasn't an aristocracy at all, it was a, a mercantile oligarchy in the Netherlands. So that's something very, very different from uh, aristocratic republicanism. And that was, uh, I think, one of the reasons why this, uh, th this phenomenon of radical enlightenment began uh, in the Dutch uh, Republic, as in a way I'll try to, to sketch briefly. So Dutch Golden Age culture was a milieu in which uh, Cartesianism scored a precocious and unparalleled general breakthrough, not only in the universities, but in general culture. It's amazing how pervasive. By already in the 1650s and 1660s, Cartesianism, Cartesianism is in Dutch culture. Uh, it would be fair to say that this general agreement about all these points. Nevertheless, there's still an urgent need to emphasize still further and perhaps explain more fully how and why structurally the radical enlightenment commenced in Holland in the mid-17th century rather than elsewhere in the world. Actually, well, the, the, the French historians have no problem with this, although perhaps they do in one or two cases. Especially American historiography have a big problem already at this point. It's axiomatic for American historians that whether you're talking about French Revolution, American Revolution, Enlightenment in general, it all comes from England. If you start by talking about Holland, immediately you're launching into a big battle because this is very problematic and very difficult for the American colleagues. They can't really adjust to that and have great difficulty with it. But that's their problem. And um, <clears throat> so attention needs to be drawn especially to the systematic, systemic, persistent vulnerability of 17th century Dutch oligarchic republicanism, the prevailing system forged in the time of Oldenbarnevelt uh, and which reached its peak in the time of Johann de Witt in the 1650s and 60s, uh, this system uh, of an oligarchic republicanism. So it's directed really by a relatively small elite of merchants. Uh, or not, they're, they're not active merchants anymore, but they come from merchant families and be have become a sitting oligarchy. Politically, down to the revolutionary era of the late 18th century, the Dutch provinces and cities remained uh, markedly less stable than the Swiss patrician republics, the Bern, Zurich, or the Italian ones, Venice and Genoa. And it's especially important to remember the implications of the, uh, and the impact of the four great Dutch political crises of 1618 to 19, Smaurits against Oldenbarnevelt, 1650, Willem de Trader, William II against Amsterdam, and 1672, William III versus, again, the true freedom oligarchs, as, um, as well as in a later context, I won't say anything about that, the Dutch political crisis of 1747 to 8. But the, the, all these four political crises created a practical political as well as a theoretical context in which uh, the, the, the basic collision is between uh, a republicanism which is uh, too narrowly based, uh, an oligarchic republicanism which is too narrowly based to be secure or stable, and a, a mixed government system uh, headed by a semi monarchical figure, Stadtholder, Prince of Orange, who uh, was already a particular object of scorn for van den Enden in 1665. That's Franciscus van den Enden, Spinoza's Latin teacher. Uh, and this Orangist faction was locked in deep, recurring, and irresolvable conflict with, with, uh, with the oligarchic republicanism. Now, the republicanism of the regents, of, 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 of De Witt's true freedom, uh, therefore, was never anything other, and it couldn't be, it inherently could not be anything other than a very weak, very unstable, and very insecure edifice of liberty and toleration. So here's something that is one of the most valuable developments, uh, progressive fist, I think you could fairly say, developments in the history of Europe, providing and offering a higher level of toleration, of uh, liberty of the press, of liberty of expression and thought, and certainly liberty of religious practice than any European society had, on that, had until that time. So it offered a great deal to many groups. This is something very valuable, which is terribly weak and terribly insecure and couldn't be anything else but very weak and very insecure. Its chances of survival were not to be rated very high. And so what was this, this challenge that was almost certain to overthrow it 
was a combination of a powerful and ambitious prince working together with the public church, Calvinist church, uh, who were more effective even than the prince in rallying the lower orders behind them. Religion is what counts. Come on, people. The common people behind it. Every time one of these political uh, crises broke out, the stadtholder would stand up and say, you're challenging my authority. I will win this battle because the common people support me and they support me because of religion. So these are, this is the basic elements of the situation that... Uh, Republicans who wanted to create a better society or to stabilize the toleration that they had in Holland faced. So the, the combination of the powerful and ambitious prince working together with a public church, rallying the lower orders behind them against the regent oligarchy who were striving to uphold toleration and individual liberty. Thus the true freedom was trapped, <coughs> was trapped in conflict with a large body of uh, theologians who joined with the Stadtholder and the common people during each successive bout of struggle, chiefly by mobilizing an intolerant and authoritarian confessional orthodoxy. Theology, in other words, pressed together with the monarchical principle to squeeze the true freedom championed by the bit round the neck to the point that its chances were practically zero. The Circus Spinoziste, therefore, are facing a very, a very clear, a very dramatic, a very obvious, and a completely undeniable critical situation. They needed a fundamentally new strategy for defending the Republic, and this need was directly linked to their fascination with the power of theology and the challenge of trying to weaken that power. According to Spinoza, dread is the cause of superstition, which means that everybody's prone to it. But from this, it also follows, he argues in the preface to the TTP, that by itself, superstition is highly unstable and changeable and cannot easily be hitched to the needs of a sovereign ruler or a durable church without elaborate ceremonies and doctrines. It needs an underpinning and a facade to give it institutional stability. This is because such instability does not spring from reason, but from passion alone. Now, quoting from the preface, Spinoza's preface, uh, in fact, from the most powerful of the passions. Therefore, it is easy for people to be captivated by a superstition, but difficult to ensure that they remain loyal to it. Samuel Jurley's rendering here makes it difficult for the reader to grasp that by this Spinoza means to get people to remain steadfastly within the same system of belief. The original Latin text, quam itaque facile est ut homines quovis superstitionis genere capiantur, tam dif difficile contra est efficere ut in uno e eodem que uh, persiste. So uh, it's difficult to make them stay within a stable system of superstition. Um, and, and I think the Latin makes it perfectly clear that, that, that Spinoza is speaking of the difficulty of getting men to remain attached to this, the same system of belief, which to him is superstition. Left to themselves, the common people would never adhere to a superstition for very long, but rather constantly be searching on all sides for new forms of credulity. Such instability is highly dangerous and continually causes revolts and upheavals. Hence, up to a point, a stabilized, institutionalized system of superstition, achieved by the immense efforts everywhere made to adorn religion, whether true or false, with pomp and ceremony, so that everyone would find it more impressive than anything else, and obviously it, uh, and observe it zealously with the highest degree of fidelity, is decidedly better as regards political and social stability if stability is your ultimate criterion. Nevertheless, stability built on institutionalized superstition involves, as Spinoza shows, great disadvantages for society too. The Turks, he suggests, have been particularly successful in stabilizing superstition to such an extent, indeed, that they believe, quoting again from the preface, that it is wicked even to argue about religion, and fill everyone's mind with so many prejudices that they leave no room for sound reason, let alone doubt. One cannot do better by way of stabilizing society than the Ottoman Empire, and there's certainly no more effective way to entrench the power of a sovereign ruler than by closely associating him with such institutionalized superstition. 
to Spinoza, this is a determining factor of politics. It may indeed be the highest secret of monarchical government and utterly essential to it. This, I, I find a key sentence in the preface to the TTP. It may indeed be the highest secret of monarchical government and utterly essential to it to keep men deceived and to disguise the fear that sways them with the specious name of religion so that they will fight for their servitude as if they were fighting for their own deliverance and will not think it humiliating but supremely glorious to spill their blood and sacrifice their lives for the glorification of a single man. By slavery or servitude, Spinoza here means a condition where citizens are obliged to submit to a sovereign's commands. But where these do not promote the common good, but rather the rulers, uh, but, but where these do not promote the common good, but rather the rulers' own advantage. Furthermore, escaping from the from political bondage in Spinoza is closely related to the individual struggle to escape from moral bondage through developing one's reasoning powers and resisting the passions. And both forms of escape are far harder for the prejudiced, superstitious, and credulous to achieve than for the rational minded. Indeed, for the uh, superstitious, uh, for the superstitious, true citizenship is effectively impossible. So he, this is one of the points where this paper, I think, intersects with the last paper and with Steve Nadler's paper as well, uh, where uh, generosity, bringing others to the threshold of, re of reason and so on, are all part of the process not only of individual fulfillment, but the, a necessary part of the process of social collaboration and creating uh, a better society. All basic, absolutely basic elements. Um, in Spinoza's political thought, I agreed entirely with the last speaker and with uh, Steve Maitler's paper too. But Spinoza's concept of citizenship is thus simultaneously pivotal to his political theory and his general philosophy. Democracy is the only form of state where philosophy as well as freedom to philosophize can flourish. Consequently, in a free republic defined as one where the free judgment of the individual is not in fact shackled with prejudice or constraints of any kind, nothing could be more detrimental than the flourishing of the well-adorned and more stable variety of credulity and superstition. So um, organized, stable religion is a very powerful force. If stability is all you want, like uh, on security, like Hobbes, it's presumably much better than the dangers of, of other forms of superstition, but that's not enough, and it certainly isn't very relevant to a context such as the Dutch Republic in the 1650s. So while institutionalizing and stabilizing superstition is the key to establishing a stable monarchy, in a free republic nothing matters more than preventing laws, constraints, and penalties being attached to belief and doctrines, which by definition are always prejudices, deflecting, co uh, deflecting coercive, uh, the, the need is to deflect coercive dogma of whatever kind from gaining the force of law. If one seeks to change a despotic authoritarian regime into a better one, argues Spinoza, the first priority, and an absolute sine qua non, is to defeat credulity and superstition. So essential is defeating credulity and superstition, first in Spinoza's philosophy and in his political theory. I mean his political theory of how to create a better society, which is what he's talking about. That is what the TTP and, and the Tractatus Politicus are concerned with. Many, histori many historians of political thought hardly see Spinoza as a fundamentally reformist and revolutionary thinker. And I think this, uh, and this, this is especially true in English-speaking countries. And I think it is really quite a barrier to a proper understanding of what he's saying. Um, and, and that has been the case for a long time. It's a traditional phenomenon in, in England, unfortunately. One sees then, given this Spinoza's framework, that there's nothing at all forced or artificial about postulating as a fundamental and defining feature of the radical enlightenment. It's tying its assault on ecclesiastical power to a, um, to a wider tendency towards social and political subversion. Those are the two things that come together, not only in Spinoza's thought, but in the collective group thought of the Circus Spinozist. 
Um, one, one of the organizers of the Marburg Conference on the Cirque du Spinoza East, uh, Sonia Lavant, is here. I can see her at this moment, but she's somewhere in the audience. And uh, that was in September 2014, a wonderful conference. And it's worth noting because on that occasion, everyone there was a specialist, uh, if not on Spinoza, then on Lodovic Meyer or Van den Enden or Adrian Kurbach or one of the other. There were papers also on other members of the Cirque du Spinoza East every single person. There was hardly any dissent. Uh, there was some nuancing here and there, but basically everyone agreed. This is the beginning of the radical enlightenment in the sense that for the first time in the history of the Western world, the rejection of religious authority in law and the construction of the moral order and the social system is coupled with democratic, i.e. not aristocratic. This is a confusion you often find in those violent polemics. I I uh, mentioned before, so I, I emphasize it. Nothing to do with uh, uh, Harringtonian and uh, Pococcian uh, arist English aristocratic republicanism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about democratic republicanism, which is something very different. Uh, this is the first time that you have this uh, linkage. Um, Moreover, a monarchy in this political theory is inherently tyrannical and less heavily circumscribed with constitutional limitations. Spinoza admires, for example, the Aragonese revolt in uh, eastern Spain against uh, Philip II in 1590 and detests uh, Philip II's, what he sees as a tyrann tyrannical monarchy in its Castilian format. He doesn't say anything about Portugal, but of course his own family had uh, actually in quite interesting ways been uh, uh, caught up in some of the issues that followed from the Spanish occupation of, uh, uh, of Portugal in 1580 but I won't go into that now. Uh, so rather than distrust, it's better to say that Spinoza harbored a deep dislike of and antagonism toward monarchy. Another point that doesn't receive yeah, many treatments of Spinoza's uh, political thought, you might almost think he's a, a, virtually a friend of monarchy. I think this, this is very wrong. Uh, a careful reading shows rather that Spinoza harbored a deep dislike and antagonism toward monarchy. It's very, very different from Hobbes. Also in the preface of the TTP, that Spinoza launches into his famous eulogy of the Dutch Republic. Spinoza here is contrasting free republics specifically with monarchy and not tyranny. Uh, and, uh, and this stands out as a fundamental principle of his thought. Consequently, it's unfortunate that Shirley's version mistranslates the key lines rendering the highest secret of monarchical government, as, as I rendered it in the quote just now, which is what the Latin says, as the supreme mystery of despotism, its prop and stay. I think this is a quite serious double mistranslation, since there's no reference in, in Spinoza's Latin either to mystery or to tyranny. He's not talking about mystery of tyranny. He's talking about organized religion and monarchy. What Spinoza is referring to is the ecclesiastical technique or means of controlling the monarch's subjects. Um, so then uh, I won't go into the, the Latin now, but uh, it, it's worth noting. Um, so it's, if indeed it is the highest secret of, of monarchical form of government and utterly basic to keep men deceived and represent the fear by which they should be held back under the specious name of religion so that they... That, so that they fight for their servitude as if for their salvation. Pino Totaro, by the way, an excellent Italian uh, scholar, correctly translates the main phrase here into Italian in her rendering of the uh, TTP as il più grande segreto del regime monarchico. That's, the, that's exactly the point. Secret of monarchical government. Nothing to do with mystery and nothing to do and not tyranny, which is a mistake here. We must avoid employing such misleading terms. Um, and I think, it, which in this paragraph, uh, the way Shirley renders it, altogether obscures what Spinoza is saying, namely that monarchy is always inherently defective, but that it is consistently and efficiently despotic only and exclusively when firmly in alliance with organized religion. A crucial component of this fundamental alliance between monarchy and organized religion, the key to understanding the functioning of monarchy, were the revenues and authority of the church and the careers these provided. 
whatever the merits of Christianity per se, and of course uh, what, what he regards as authentic Christianity is something for which uh, Spinoza has, um, has a very favourable view. Uh, but whatever the merits of Christianity per se, because its offices were lucrative and its pastors regarded by the common people as great dignitaries, those who came forward to fill the sacred offices, he said, were consequently the worst kind of people, <laughs> and the impulse to spread God's religion degenerated into sordid greed and ambition. So there's a very, very big d gap in Spinoza between uh, the pure Christianity, which which is very short-lived because it, it doesn't really survive the apostles in his estimation, uh, and uh, the history of the church, which is something totally different. Um, he's considerable respect for pure pre-apostolic Christianity offered by Christ, but none at all for the Christianity of the apostles, except for Paul, as, as, <laughs> as Yitzhak Melamed was reminding me yesterday and earlier today. Paul, Paul is another special case, uh, and uh, all those, that, or most of those who came after the apostles. Quoting again, unsurprisingly then, nothing remains of the religion of the early church except its external ritual, by which the common people seem to adulate rather than venerate God, and faith amounts to nothing more than credulity and prejudices, quam credulitas et prejudicia. This amounted to uh, a sustained and vehement attack on Protestantism, Catholicism, and the Orthodox churches altogether, a, a program for which Spinoza could expect uh, considerable sympathy and support from his uh, several collegiate and Sicinian, as well as his free-thinking friends. And I think it's very relevant to remember that our circular Spinozist in Amsterdam, and soon not only in Amsterdam, but also in Leiden, in Rotterdam, in Utrecht, and in other Dutch towns by the 1670s, uh, certainly it included outright free-thinkers like van den Enden and uh, Lodewijk Meyer, and uh, I would say Adrian Korbach, although there's some disagreement about that. that uh, the Marble Conference, there were one or two participants who thought they could detect a, a, a theological underlay to uh, Korbach, but that's a matter for dispute. But in any case, it, it's interesting that you have outright free thinkers working uh, together and in close discussion with Sicinians and Collegians. So that's to say extreme fringe Christians who um, represent a Christianity which doesn't have an organized or professional clergy. So those dignitaries are not there, those salaries are not there, and the mysteries are not there because the Sicinians didn't have any trinity and, uh, uh, or, or even original sin, and uh, they claimed at least to that their only criterion when interpreting scripture was the criterion of reason and nothing else. Uh, there were still some points of argument and differences, but clearly there was... Uh, common ground here, which enabled the free thinkers and the Sicinians in the uh, and collegians in the uh, Circus Spinozis to collaborate together and to form a kind of uh, a wider program uh, coalescing the two key things ecclesiastical authority to be demolished, a democratic republican society to replace it, which will provide the freedoms and the higher moral order as they saw it in so and the toleration and the freedom of expression and freedom to fulfill philosophized, which were the indispensable ingredients of this uh, better society. Um, so uh, Spinoza's harshness here, emotionally powered no doubt by the horrific religious persecution to which many members of his own family had been subjected in uh, Vidigera, which was his uh, father's town in southern Portugal, extends to his actually saying uh, and what prejudices they are at quae uh, prejudicia. They turn rational men into, the, these prejudices turn rational men into brutes since they completely prevent each person from using his own free judgment and from distinguishing truth from falsehood. They seem purposely designed altogether to extinguish the light of the intellect. Again, Shirley's rendering notably weakens and obscures the meaning by translating credulity credulitas et prejudicia as credulity and biased dogma. And worse, uh, ad quae prejudicia, he translates as but what 
but what dogma? But Spinoza's target is not dogma, uh, but all religious authority, which is again veiled by the way it's translated into English. When he spe- uh, speaks of scripturam sin- sine praejudicio interpretari, he doesn't mean interpret scripture in a manner free of dogma, but free of all theological notions, which is, which is a different thing. The alliance between monarchy and religious authority is the chief basis of despotism as Spinoza analyzes it. At the same time, an important component in the edifice of religious authority, he argues, and one fundamental to the mysteries he decries, are the speculations of the Aristotelians and Platonists. Uh, Aristotelicorum et Platonicorum speculationis. He accuses the theologians of having built their theology in considerable part on the constructs of Greek dualist philosophy and rendered the prophetic writings of the Old Testament entirely nonsensical by interpreting them in the light of Aristotelian and Platonist concepts. It's far from surprising that the theologians have failed to add anything novel on a any philosophical question, he suggests, other than what has long been commonplace in ancient philosophy. For if you ask what mysteries they discover hidden in scripture, you will find nothing but the fabrications of Aristotle or Plato or some like philosopher, which mostly uh, could be more readily dreamt up by some layman than derived from scripture by even the most consummate scholar. This sustained uh, polemic against Plato and Aristotle, of course, runs right through Spinoza's oeuvre. In the concluding chapter of the TTP, chapter 20, Spinoza reminds us that the subjugation of individual judgment by higher authority can never be complete, but it can stretch very far and become systematically violent and oppressive. Insofar as such subjugation of judgment is to be considered possible, it would be most likely to to arise under, under a Uh, monarchical government and least probable under a democratic one where all the people or a large part of them hold power collectively. Shortly after this follows Spinoza's famous line, finis ergo republicae rivera libertas es. The the goal of the republic uh, finally is, uh, is, is liberty. It's hardly open to question that Spinoza is arguing strongly in favour of the democratising republic against monarchical government and that this is the core of his republican creed, especially in the period before the Anglo-French assault on the Dutch Republic, uh, this is Louis XIV's war against the Dutch, uh, attack on the Dutch Republic in 1672 and the consequent Orange's coup in Holland in 1672. It is true that this democratic republican perspective is slightly modified in the later Tractatus Politicus, uh, which Spinoza wrote in the uh, the last stage of his life uh, in in retrospect, looking back on what to him were the disastrous uh, developments and the collapse of the true freedom, uh, literally the brothers de Witt being torn uh, to pieces in the street, and the Orange's coup of 1672. But uh, in the Tractatus Politicus, as well as in the TTP, uh, Spinoza is setting out a conception of republican citizenship which represents a political philosophy dramatically and fundamentally different from that of Hobbes and Locke, and in in certain respects much more closely tied to the radical tendencies of uh, the 18th century, of some aspects of Rousseau, especially the general will, which is very, very closely connected with uh, Spinoza's The Common Good, uh, and uh, the democratic republican tendency, which is one of the three, I divide the French Revolution into three ideologies, which are at war with each other. So where uh, uh, Fouvet, for instance, um, I would, yes, conclude very, very briefly. Um, <laughs> well, uh, let me cut that part about the revolution and just go on to my last, uh, my last paragraph, and then I'll stop. Um, Spinoza has two connected main aims in the TTP, he explains in his preface, to emancipate philosophy from being shackled and enslaved to theology and to priesthoods, and to help free men from lay despotism and tyrannical potentates. In other words, from all political authorities using divine sanction, priestly sanction, and revelation to buttress the laws and compel men to bow down before their appointed religious spokesmen and institutions, the social and educational values priesthoods proclaim. Accordingly, 
in Spinoza's philosophy, linking democratic republicanism to rejecting religious authority philosophically is the basic strategy from the outset and throughout. This feature of Spinoza's thought that so decisively sets his political thought apart from that of Hobbes and Locke and all other 16th and 17th century political writers likewise typified the outlook of the Circus Spinozist as a whole. Of course, here especially, it is uh, van den Enden who preceded Spinoza in linking the attack on religious authority to democratic republicanism, uh, and uh, uh, Korbach and uh, Peter and Johann de la Cour, those four in, in this especially, were interested, of course, in developing democratic republicanism. Um, when seeking a historical philosophical explanation for this unique group phenomenon, we should therefore undoubtedly take into account the peculiarity and uniqueness of the political and religious circumstances of the prosperous and successful but politically precarious Dutch Republic during the first Dutch period between 1615 and 72. Its specific circumstances provided the specific setting in which this complex new intellectual and philosophical phenomenon could germinate and take shape. Thank you very much for listening. I'm so sorry that I had to push you. I, I, I'm so sorry that I had to push you, but we are short in time. Uh, beautiful. Charles Ramon. Fascinating talk. Uh, C'est pour moi un grand honneur, un grand plaisir d'être le répondant aujourd'hui du professeur Jonathan Israël, dont le grand livre, son titre est son sous-titre français, qui n'est pas exactement le même que l'anglais, Les Lumières radicales, la philosophie de Spinoza et la naissance de la modernité 1650-1750, paru dans sa traduction aux éditions Amsterdam en 2001, a eu un très grand retentissement ici comme ailleurs dans le monde. Pour les spinozistes, à supposer qu'une telle chose existe, disons plutôt pour les lecteurs de Spinoza et les historiens des idées et de la philosophie de Spinoza, il était particulièrement impressionnant, et il faut le dire agréable, de voir placer Spinoza en figure centrale, tutélaire, principielle, des lumières radicales, ou de la modernité dans son aspect le plus incisif, dans l'ensemble de l'Europe. J'ai bien sûr lu, comme nous tous, ce grand livre, avec un intérêt passionné, et je suis heureux que la conférence donnée aujourd'hui par Jonathan Israël me donne l'occasion d'une réflexion un texte euh, ou d'une discussion de l'un de ses concepts principaux. Comme on le voit en effet dans le titre de l'intervention de Denis, paragraphe 2. Les noms anglophones doivent avoir un texte, enfin les noms francophones doivent avoir un texte, au moins. Okay. Donc, comme on le voit en effet dans le titre de l'intervention de Jonathan Israël, il s'agit de savoir ce que Spinoza doit au contexte théologico-politique de l'âge d'or hollandais. Euh, je ne discuterai pas ici le fond ou la substance des réponses apportées par Jonathan Israël, car ma compétence historique serait ici tout à fait insuffisante, même si elle me permet pour l'essentiel de penser que toutes les indications apportées ici par Jonathan Israël sont non seulement précieuses pour moi comme pour tous ceux qui s'intéressent à la naissance de la modernité, mais tout à fait convaincantes en elles-mêmes. Ma question serait plutôt, qu'est-ce au fond qu'un contexte Je rappelle la question, que ce qui nous a doit-il au contexte théologico-politique de la joie hollandais Donc qu'est-ce au fond un contexte C'est une question peut-être plus difficile et plus mystérieuse qu'il ne semble au premier abord. C'est pourquoi il est particulièrement excitant, me semble-t-il, de pouvoir l'aborder aujourd'hui avec Jonathan Israël, dans la mesure où, dirais-je, il me semble que cet établissement du bon contexte est le cœur même de toutes ses recherches, comme de toute sa méthode. J'ai employé ici volontairement le mot neutre, établissement du, beau, du bon contexte, mais bien d'autres termes seraient possibles, dont chacun soulève de très importantes questions de méthode en histoire de la philosophie et à vrai dire en philosophie si l'on veut bien admettre, ce qui est mon cas, qu'il n'y a pas rupture, mais transition entre philosophie et histoire de la philosophie. Quelles seraient donc les expressions possibles Découvrir le contexte Révéler le contexte Établir le contexte Autant de façons de rechercher, et il me semble que c'est là le centre de la démarche de Jonathan Israël, un contexte que l'on pourrait appeler objectif, et qui, de ce fait, serait une base pour expliquer, 
rendre compte, justifier, là encore, bien des options seraient possibles, l'existence ou la nature d'une pensée. En l'occurrence, le titre de Jonathan d'Israël est particulièrement significatif. Que devait ou que doit Spinoza au contexte théologico-politique hollandais La recherche, la mise en évidence, la révélation, la description, la peinture d'un certain contexte doit donc nous permettre de découvrir en retour ce qu'un philosophe doit à ce contexte. Et une fois que l'on aura compris ce que le philosophe doit au contexte, alors on aura compris. Mais compris quoi, au fait Telle me semble être la question qui ne peut manquer de se poser dans le cadre d'une réflexion sur la question du contexte en philosophie. On tombe en effet, dès le début, sur un paradoxe bien connu, mais qui pour autant n'en reste pas moins difficile. L'explication par le contexte conduit en effet logiquement à une sorte de destruction de ce que l'on est justement en train de construire. Je n'ose dire une déconstruction, mais je le vrai. En effet, plus vous expliquerez une philosophie par son contexte, et moins elle méritera qu'on l'explique, et qu'on s'intéresse à elle. Supposons que Spinoza s'explique par le contexte hollandais du siècle d'or. Alors, plus on connaîtra ce contexte, et c'est bien sûr ce qu'a fait admirablement Jonathan Israël dans toutes ses œuvres, plus donc on connaîtra ce contexte, plus nous saurons ce que Spinoza lui doit, et plus la figure de Spinoza va diminuer, diminuer, jusqu'à être entièrement absorbée par le contexte. À la limite, la philosophie de Spinoza, de ce point de vue, ne serait rien d'autre qu'un effet d'un contexte, lui-même considéré comme cause. Il y aurait parfaite continuité, parfaite transition du contexte à Spinoza. Et d'une certaine façon, à la limite, la philosophie de Spinoza, entendue comme effet d'un contexte, ne mériterait pas toute l'attention qu'on lui aurait consacrée. Il y a un difficile paradoxe, mais que je crois l'historien des idées doit considérer et affronter lucidement, tout autant que l'historien de la philosophie. Car bien sûr, d'un côté, nous acceptons tous l'idée que le contexte est indispensable pour comprendre une philosophie ou une pensée. Mais en même temps, nous refusons au fond cette idée, au moment même où nous l'énonçons. Car ce qui nous intéresse dans une pensée ou dans une philosophie, et tout particulièrement dans la philosophie de Spinoza, c'est ce en quoi elle échappe au contexte, sort du contexte, crève le contexte, Aurélie Derrida. C'est-à-dire, en un mot, ce en quoi elle ne s'explique pas par le contexte, voire ce en quoi elle crée un nouveau contexte, ou de nouvelles façons de voir, ou de concevoir les choses et les problèmes. C'est bien sûr le sens du titre de Negri, l'anomalie sauvage. Je n'emploie pas cette référence et la soi comme un argument d'autorité. J'aurais bien des désaccords avec Negri, je m'en suis expliqué ailleurs. Mais c'est seulement pour donner un nom, l'anomalie sauvage, sur une attente qui, semble-t-il, est aussi forte en chacun de nous concernant la philosophie que la réduction d'une philosophie par le contexte. Je partagerai donc ici pour l'essentiel les critiques que Guérou avait adressées à Wolfson. Il y a quelque chose d'intrinsèquement contradictoire à vouloir, je cite, plutôt, je mets entre guillemets, expliquer un événement par son contexte. Car plus vous expliquez par le contexte, plus vous affaiblissez la dimension événementielle. Par exemple, j'ai toujours été surpris lorsque j'étais enfant, et par la suite cette surprise s'est souvent renouvelée, lorsque je lisais dans des livres d'histoire des chapitres sur les causes ou le contexte de la Révolution française, ou du déclenchement de la Première ou de la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Si le contexte ex expliquait si bien ces événements, me disais-je, en quoi était-il surprenant, hors du commun Pourquoi ont-ils dépassé par leur ampleur ou leur violence tout ce que les hommes étaient alors capables de prévoir et d'expliquer Il y avait là un piège logique dont il me semble aujourd'hui encore difficile de sortir. Un vouloir à la fois l'explication par le contexte et l'événementialité, et refuser d'abandonner l'un au profit de l'autre. Sans doute, dans la vie courante, nous vivons dans de nombreuses contradictions et de nombreux paradoxes, c'est même sans doute indispensable pour mener une vie normale, mais le travail du philosophe n'est-il pas justement d'oser affronter ces paradoxes, de ne pas s'en satisfaire et d'essayer de les résoudre et puisque nous en sommes maintenant au terme du psychologue, il me semble que l'on pourrait mettre en évidence le rapport entre ces questions du contexte, telles que les pose la conférence de Jonathan Israël, et la façon dont ces questions sont déjà apparues dans d'autres interventions. Je pense par exemple à l'intervention de Stephen Barbone, 
qui est malheureusement parti, euh, au sujet des limites de l'individualité chez Spinoza. C'est une question bien connue et toujours difficile chez Spinoza. Où commence et où finit une individualité ou une chose singulière Un couple qui danse est-il une chose singulière Et que dire d'une troupe militaire en train de défiler D'une nation, de l'humanité, de l'univers, la facies totius universi Nous savons que Spinoza, dans une certaine mesure, nous permettrait de répondre positivement à de telles questions. C'est-à-dire, en effet, ce sont des choses singulières, mais peut-être pas toutes mais à y réfléchir, la question de l'individu ou de la chose singulière et celle du contexte sont une seule et même question. Où commence et où finit un contexte Autrement dit, où commence et où finit l'extériorité par rapport à une situation donnée Pour être le contexte de la philosophie de Spinoza, l'âge d'or de la Hollande doit être extérieur à la philosophie de Spinoza. Mais si l'âge d'or de la Hollande est extérieur à la philosophie de Spinoza, pourra-t-il l'expliquer et inversement, si Spinoza et la Hollande du XVIIe siècle forment une seule chose singulière, ce qui ne serait pas forcément absurde, comment l'une pourrait-elle expliquer l'autre Plus généralement... Charles, il te reste combien de pages <rire> Non, vas-y, vas-y. Non, mais parce qu'on on va pas... F... Je suis désolé de... Je ne vais pas tu Comment Non, 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 je ne veux pas t'emmerder. Je, 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 je suis honteux moi-même de, ma, de la l'attitude que j'ai. Plus généralement, donc, cette question du contexte est centrale pour un des auteurs qui a souvent été évoqué dans ce colloque, à savoir Alexandre Matron. À savoir Alexandre Matron. Donc Jonathan Israël a employé dans sa conférence le terme de milieu, qui est un autre terme pour contexte. Hein. Or, justement, dans Individu et Communauté, on voit Matron hésiter sans cesse entre une interprétation continuiste de l'histoire du monde, entre, entendu comme l'avènement progressif de la rationalité et de la béatitude, dans une démocratie conçue comme un effet ou un résultat presque mécanique de l'ordre des choses, et une interprétation discontinuiste, événementielle, où l'intervention d'un philosophe, par exemple, ou du Christ, s'avérerait décisive. Je cite Matron, « Encore faut-il qu'on écoute le philosophe au moins une fois en cet instant décisif qui doit modifier irréversiblement le cours des choses. » Dans le premier cas, on peut envisager une explication par le contexte, pas dans le second. Plus généralement, on sait que Matron envisageait dans sa lecture de Spinoza la politique comme la fabrication d'un contexte ou d'un milieu favorable à l'apparition de la philosophie ou d'une communauté de sages ou d'hommes raisonnables qui se comporterait de façon éthique et qui, de ce fait, n'aurait plus besoin de la politique appelée à disparaître comme tout ce qui est en extériorité. L'idée de Matron était d'expliciter la notion de cadre ou de milieu ou de contexte par celle d'analogie ou de comme si la politique, au moment de l'unification, le moment de l'unification interne, externe pardon, selon ces termes, serait ainsi chez lui l'analogie ou le comme si de la rationalité ou de la véritable libération éthique. Je cite Matron, hein, donc je ne cite pas. Si. Cela dépend des causes extérieures et d'elles seules, écrit Matron. Cette condition implique donc que les causes extérieures s'organisent d'elles-mêmes de façon à nous faire agir comme si la seule raison de nous commander. Tant que la raison demeure incapable de voler de ses propres ailes, nous ne pouvons vivre selon ses exigences que si nos aliénations sont convenablement dirigées. Donc la théorie du comme si est à ce point centrale et capitale qu'elle est présentée, mise en évidence dans, toutes les, dans les toutes dernières lignes et dans toutes les, les toutes dernières pages du livre, dans un paragraphe que Macron a séparé de tout le reste du livre par deux blancs, un avant, un après. Je cite ce petit paragraphe. Ainsi écrit Macron, le milieu culturel aménagé par ce genre d'État, c'est-à-dire l'État libéral institutionnalisé, est-il au plus haut point favorable Il nous prépare à devenir raisonnable et en attendant, il nous détermine à agir comme si nous l'étions déjà. Non seulement il nous fournit la pointe passionnelle dont notre raison a besoin pour faire triompher ses exigences, mais il crée les conditions extérieures d'un progrès intellectuel au terme duquel nous pourrons nous passer de ce même à point. On voit finalement que poussé à son terme, l'explication par le contexte le cadre ou le milieu ne peut rendre compte de l'émergence d'une réalité événementielle ou d'une rupture, comme par exemple l'apparition d'un philosophe, d'une révolution ou l'avènement de la rationalité, qu'à la condition de postuler une boucle temporelle par laquelle ce qui viendra après et qui est à expliquer est déjà présent sous la forme du milieu, du contexte, du comme-ci ou du jeu dans la situation qui précède l'événement. Ma question serait donc... L'explication d'une philosophie, en particulier celle de Spinoza, qui a toujours une forte dimension de rébellion et d'intempestivité, par la recherche d'un contexte objectif, même s'il nous est presque impossible d'y résister, 
donc à cette tentation, ne supposerait-elle pas de payer un prix conceptuel trop élevé Telle est la question que j'avais envie de poser depuis longtemps à ce très éminent historien des idées qui est Jonathan Israël, qui nous a tant appris et avec qui je serais si heureux de pouvoir dialoguer aujourd'hui. Not this time. Not this time. OK, OK, this was a head-on refutation. It would deserve a whole conference. So what I decide is, Jonathan, if you'd like to uh, say just uh, a We few... have so little time. Yes, we, very, we, very we, briefly, you, you have two briefly. minutes, and, uh, because after that, Pierre-François Moreau needs to uh, say something as well. Yeah. And we are now very, very short. Of course, these are huge questions yeah. which we all and very, very take very seriously. And, and very well expressed. <laughs> No. No. <laughs> This discussion will take place in, in another place. La discussion annoncée sur le programme, discussion générale, aura lieu, Chantal, ailleurs. We, we are sorry. This is a very unfortunate uh, constraint. Please. Uh, but just very briefly, and of course we would need to go into more detail when we, we talk together. As a historian, I have to say everything, every person, every philosopher, whatever it is, artist, must be a product of his historical context, just like the Second World War. But, and here I think the Cirque Spinozist is a perfect example of the point that I would want to make in, in reply to you. Because the others, they had some talents, they are interesting writers, they are products of this context. They, they include all the elements that I tried to refer to as being basic. But they didn't have the genius to see how this could be elaborated into a systematic philosophy which was effective in every way, in moral philosophy, in, in every sphere of philosophy, in, as well as political thought and, and, and other areas. And it, it, Spinoza shows a, a greatness and a genius of which there's very little sign in any of them. But, I, it's, but at the same time, it is true that they were not just a circle sitting around Spinoza, accepting his great insights. Part of Spinoza's greatness was that you had this wider drama, and then you had a circle uh, interacting with each other, and it was not only they receiving ideas from Spinoza, but Spinoza receiving ideas from, from them. So his greatness was somehow drawn also partly from them. Very important. It's the problem of the amphibology of pure reason in Kant. Okay, so interior, exterior. Pierre-François Moreau, Baruch Spinoza in person. Je serai rapide, je n'ai pas de souci pour que... Simplement, il y a... Thank you so much. Merci, pardon. Il y a, je crois, qu'on avait montré avec Chantal Jacquet, que nous pouvions faire dialoguer les spinozistes italiens et français. Et ça avait été très réussi. Et je crois que cette année, nous avons réussi à montrer à nous tous que nous pouvions organiser encore un dialogue entre les spinozistes européens, français et euh, américains. Il ne reste plus qu'à recommencer les années suivantes avec les Brésiliens, les Norvégiens, les Chinois, etc. Une <rire> chose, euh, tout ce qui a été écrit à vocation à être publié, donc j'ai passé, enfin, peut-être pas tout, au moins ce qui a été dit et écrit ici, donc, nous demandons à tous ceux qui ont donné des textes et à ceux qui ont répondu de nous envoyer d'ici le mois d'octobre une version euh, la même ou plus développée de leur texte et nous vous ferons des propositions pour la publication par courrier électronique. Enfin, je rappelle que les participants américains et répondants français sont invités à un cours de départ tout à l'heure à 18h, c'est-à-dire dans. En milieu, de ce que vous Et les, et les présidents de séance Et les autres Et maintenant, merci à tous. Et merci aux organisateurs.